Hi guys, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, we got ourselves a 2011 Dodge Durango, uh, 5.7 liter Hemi. It's the all-wheel drive Citadel. Um, it's my car, yeah. Oh, if you can believe it, finally got a chance to do a little bit of work on it. Now, the big complaint that I have about this thing is the back end. And if you have one of these, particularly if it's a uh, Citadel like this or an RT, I don't know if it's in any of the others, but maybe. If you have one that it feels really, really bouncy, and not just a regular bouncy, but it's a back end feels kind of squirrely, then hey, here's a video for you. Let me show you how you fix this thing. I've heard this complaint a lot. It's not just on my vehicle. I know a lot of people that have kind of gotten in these they drove it for a little bit and you know what they said hey i don't like that they traded in uh, or they didn't buy it and they, they got something else because of this issue well it is fixable it's a funny thing so let me tell you kind of what it's doing um where i live there's a lot of uneven pavement there's a lot of potholes all that sort of stuff if i'm changing lanes and the back end kind of goes over some of that unevenness or you know there's a snow drip between the lanes if I do that while I'm accelerating, the whole back end feels really squirrely. Not just the regular bounce, but it feels squirrely. Now, the, the normal thing to think of is, well, how are the shocks and struts? <laughs> well, I can tell you, probably not good. They do have Chrysler symbols on them still. It tells you everything you need to know. And it's got like 300,000 kilometers. Now, who knows, maybe they put some uh, factory ones on at some point. <laughs> I doubt it though, especially from where this car came from. But it feels like more than just shocks. Just shocks doesn't really explain it. I keep expecting something to be worn out, you know, a, a rear upper control arm, something like that. Every time I do an oil change on or change the tires over, anytime it's in the shop, I put it up, you know, unload the suspension, check everything. Up, down, left, right, BA, start, select. Because I swear something's worn out, not just shocks. So, go to order some shocks and, uh, you know, wanted to put them in last weekend, but here we are because you need more than just shocks. So you got two options. There's the standard shock and then there's the load leveling suspension system. Wow, load leveling, go back there. I don't see any air springs. I don't see any electronics. There's nothing hooked up to that shock. It's just a regular shock, right? No, it is not. They call it a needle mat shock. Some goofy system designed by Saks. So, uh, of course I had to put it back in because you need the shock mount. You can't transfer that over. So, I'll get it up in the air. And I'll show you, uh, it's really simple to, to take out, hopefully, uh, on yours, hopefully the, the bolts don't bite you in mine, they came out pretty nice, thankfully. Um, and then, yeah, you can put a standard shock in there, I'll show you what the, the Nevo mats look like, and I'll show you kind of what they do, or at least what they're supposed to do, and I'll show you why they're a problem. So, uh, I'll also do the oil change too, because, <laughs> Yeah, it's due. Let me get set up, get it up in the air, uh, start draining the oil, and uh, start yanking some wheels off, and I'll show you the shocks and why they're a problem. Do, do, do. So, I'm a firm believer, and I don't want my oil filter coming off while I'm driving. So, I make sure they're tight. And usually, if you look at the oil filter, they'll usually have instructions, particularly the Napa ones. Those are pretty impressive. They'll say, you turn it until it's snug, until it's down, and then turn it another half of a turn to three quarters of a turn. Well, frick, I think I tighten mine a lot, and I can't get, uh, I can barely get a half turn after it kind of bottoms out. So, I like them tight, I don't like them coming off.
Give it a spray of the good stuff. <clears throat> now, the other thing I'll mention, I just want to take a quick moment. This is my vehicle, so I don't really have to worry about it. If there was any chance, say this was a customer's vehicle or your, your secondary vehicle or whatever, if there was any chance of you getting distracted, then you know what? Uh, right now, even if you're planning on doing other stuff, get this out of the way, drop it down, put oil in it, right? At the very least, so this car here takes, you know, just under seven liters. At the very least, just dump the five liter jug in there, right? You don't have to check it, but make sure you got something in there so that if someone accidentally fired it up, you know what, even if you're a couple liters low, it'll be fine, right? A couple liters low is a lot better than no oil. Or, you know what, if it's a customer's vehicle in your shop or whatever, take the key out of the ignition, throw it in your toolbox and lock your toolbox. You don't want someone to accidentally hop in there and start it. Because you know what, they might not even mean to start it. It could just be something as simple as you go to turn the key and all you're trying to do is see the odometer. You know, this is a push button. You accidentally have your foot on the brake too, so it fires up, right? Things can happen. So avoid that. Either take your key, put it in the toolbox, lock it up, or just before you do anything else, throw some oil in there. Save yourself a headache. So on that note, I'm gonna get this out of here. Uh, we'll start uh, tearing the wheels off at the back and get on these shocks, eh? Okay, so we're getting ready to change the shock. Uh, I've already changed the one on the other side, and this is what they look like. Um, this is the load leveling shock. It is by Saks, so you probably will see a sticker that looks kind of like that. Um, these all are awfully expensive. My cost on these, I was seeing for aftermarket ones, anywhere from $500 to $1,200. Um, uh, sorry, retail was anywhere from $500 to $1,200. For my normal supplier, my cost was $500 a piece. Um, so yeah, I ain't putting those in there, that's for sure. Plus, I don't like them. I don't want them in there because I don't want to have this kind of happen again. Um, and I'll show you exactly, once we get that one out, we can compare. Ha! <laughs> Left to right. Wow. Um, but yeah, so this is all it looks like for a load leveling shock. You don't see any air springs. There's no electrical connectors. There's no air pump. There's none of that. Just looks like a regular shock, but yeah, maybe a little, a little beefier. Now, keep in mind, if you get, we'll open these up. Come on. Do, do, do. Come on. More paraphernalia. Oh, I think that's just a sticker. Oh, got instructions. Yeah, there's a sticker in there somewhere. Come on, there we go. That out of the way. Ah, for your toolbox. <laughs> You need the shock mount. Oh, kind of learned that the hard way. Learned a lot of this the hard way last week and went to go put this in. And that's when I found out, yes, in fact, I did have the load leveling shock. So then, um, then there's the question, can I install the regular one? Because I don't want to put something that expensive in. And with doing a bit of research, yes, I was able to find out that, come on, that you can put the standard shock in. You don't have to put one of these in. However, the, um, the thread size is different for your rod. I can't remember. I think this is M10 on the uh, on the Neva mat, so the self-levelings, and then the standard shock is M12. The standard shock is bigger than the, uh, the self-levelings. 
So in order to put these in, which you can do, you need to get the mounts. Now, we got all that, we learned all that, we learned that we can put it in. So let me show you, we'll put it in. Okay, so anytime I'm taking out shocks, I always put a screw stand underneath the control arm, particularly as close to that spring as possible. And I try and get it somewhere that it's not gonna slip out. Now, on these control arms, we still have all the arms connected. We still have the sway bar connected, all that stuff. So it's not gonna fly out. That spring's not gonna come out and hit us in the face. But still, we wanna be able to do things controlled. Um, we definitely don't want that spring to have to unseat and us uh, have to kind of um, reposition it. But the other big thing that we don't want to do, if we look at that bolt, the shock mounting bolt, and we go, there's the nut on that side. We don't know, unless you've done a few of these, we don't know if that's under tension. So if we go to zip that out, um, you can end up ripping all the threads out of that bolt if it's under tension. So that's another reason why I like having a screw stand under there. We can kind of work with things. And likewise, speaking of tension, if we look up to the bolts, way up in there and you see the uh, dust shield is off that one. It's not like that because I had put the stupid thing back. And uh, I'll talk about that later, but the dust shield is not transferable over. But if we look up there, so the bolts go straight up. So anytime you have something like that, and oh yeah, the other thing that's really nice, the bolts are from the outside of the vehicle going in. So you don't have to open up the lift gate, go climbing through the back, open up some access panel to try and get to that stuff from the inside. I uh, hate doing that. So these are really nice. But since the bolts are up there, what we can do, one second here. Um, what we can do is we can undo one of the bolts one at a time, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. That way, everything kind of comes down gently just in case this is under a lot of tension because I like to try and have it neutral. I like to try and do it as gentle as possible. So you can, if you really wanted to, you can remove this whole fender liner. Um, that's more than we need to do. Uh, it's, you got enough room, you can get in there with extensions. This shock right here I know is completely knackered so I'll have no problem compressing it. The one on the passenger side, uh, there's no way I was compressing that with any ease. So on that side I did have to kind of take out a few of the trim clip fasteners so I could pull the splash shield out. So uh, without further ado, those bolts up there, they are 16s. Let me get an impact. I'll start loosening those out. About to get noisy in here. And what I do is I just do a little bit at a time. Helps if we're on the high power setting. Okay, it feels like there's a bit of tension, so I'm going to go up on my screw stand just to relieve some of that. There we go. Perfect. I don't like all that force pulling on these screws, bolts, I mean. Okay, that's what they look like. They are 16s. Now we have that bottom bolt. I guess I can take these off for now. The bottom bolt, um, because I have my screw stand kind of in the way, can't really get to the nut very easily. 
So I'm going to go on the bolt side. I'm going to hold the nut. The bolt is a 21, the nut's a 24. Uh, I'm going to hold the nut with a wrench and then impact the bolt. Um, just because it can't really get to the nut that easily. So the unfortunate thing about turning the bolt, the bolt is, if you can see that, it is knurled. So if you turn it, you, you might wear down the knurling a little bit, but um, honestly, I'm not too terribly concerned about that. <laughs> this bolt ain't going anywhere, especially once we tighten it, which we'll be tightening it a lot. Okay, so now, now is the time when you might have to actually take this out. But this guy here, if it's still like what it was last week, yeah, wow, that's a head scratcher. Oh, ha, that is a head scratcher. Ha, some days you got days where it's kind of a wonder they actually got out of bed in the morning. I thought for a second there, <laughs> looking at that, I thought that somehow, somehow I was completely losing my mind last week and I thought that somehow I put the bump stop on top of the dust shield. Wow. I even said earlier that I didn't put the dust shield back on. Hmm. This is what happens when you work every day of the week almost. Well, Can we do it? Oh, I think so. Can we? Oh, 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 there we go. So, hmm, probably would be easier to remove the dust shield on that side to show you but can you see the difference that's what was happening with these things this guy here is right knackered it's not going to full extension whereas the other one is going to full extension so this one right here really hard to compress that and maybe even too hard I don't know maybe this one's not compressing at all and this one here right <laughs> there's nothing there wow so that's what was happening that was what was giving me my kind of real squirrely motion when I hit bumps that this side right here was resisting all the bumps um barely compressing at all and this side here just got nothing it's gonna be a lot better now wow okay so the one thing i did transfer over i did transfer over the bump stop it's not a perfect fit but you know what uh, i kind of feel like it's better than nothing so how do you get this apart if you notice that nut is recessed in there right you're not really going to get to the top of that shaft very well and if you're familiar with shocks if i hold this mount in the vise when i go to turn that nut i'm just going to be turning the shaft so 
how do you hold the shaft? Particularly if you're one like this, right? You can't even get to the rod. On this one here, I could get to the shaft a little bit, but you know what? That's hardened tool steel. You know what happens when you try and get a pair of vice grips on there? They just slip. So let me show you what I did because these are the garbage ones and it actually worked. So I'm going to throw this in a vise and I'll get my impact and I'll show you when I'm set up. Okay, so first thing I do, spray a little bit of movement in there. And we grab our impact. Okay, of course, this is the one that I had all last week, so it comes out. Well, you know what? I can show you with tightening it back up. Maybe. No, that just went down as well. Well, obviously yours not gonna come out that easy. There'll be crust, there'll be all kinds of things. So what I did that actually worked, just trying something, is I grabbed the base of the shock in the vise and I just pulled really hard on it off to the side just to kind of cause that to really tweak um, into the washer. And that actually applied enough force that I was able to get it off. So we want that bump stop. Sorry to interrupt, just going through editing right now and just kind of wanted to mention one quick little thing. The reason why I'm pulling the old shock apart was just to get to the bump stop. This guy right here, right? Just because it made me feel a little bit better. Now, if you're trying to do this at home and say it's just spinning, you can't get that nut apart, you can't get the old shock apart, I would say don't worry about it. You're not using anything else on the old shock that you can transfer over to the standard shock. Even then, this bump stop, it doesn't really fit that good. Sure, it would still act as a bump stop, but looking at the two, the standard shock has much more travel than the load leveling shock. You're not going to bottom this thing out. Even if you did, right? The Durango is not an off-roading vehicle, right? If you hit something so extreme as to bottom it out, you're doing damage to that shock anyways, right? So whether you have this guy in there or not, uh, if you don't have that in there, then yeah, you're, you damage it a little more prematurely, worst case scenario, whatever, you have to change that shock. But you, you know what, it's, it's not designed to be uh, off-roading, rock crawling, you're going to be damaging stuff anyways, right? So I just wanted to mention that since switching over to a standard shock, you, you need a different mount anyways. If you can't get the old one apart, don't worry about this it's not really that big of a deal it, if i went to take the old one apart and if it was just spinning i wouldn't have bothered grinding it or anything like that i would just said eh, screw it i'll just put the uh the standard shock in with the mount without a bump stop so just wanted to mention that if you can't get it apart don't worry about it so uh back to the video Okay, and now you can really see the difference between the load leveling shock and a standard shock. So you can see the, the thread size of the load leveling shock is much smaller than the thread size of the standard shock. So you do need a separate mount. Okay, so I removed the dust shield on both of these so you can get a, a bit of a comparison. Yeah. Now, of course, you wouldn't really have these issues if they were standard shocks. You'd still have, you know, a bouncy end, but they would equalize to a point. Um, this one right here, let's see if I can't compress it a little bit. 
Oh, no, I can't. Yeah, I have exact. Holy oh, crap. I have exact opposites. I have one that I can't compress, and then the other one that I can compress with my baby finger. Oh, it's stiff. Stiff on the extension. Yeah, junk. Let's go put that standard shock in. Okay, so we got our standard shock. We got our bump stop. It is much bigger, but you know what? I kinda like it rather than not having it. So I'm gonna use it. We get our new shock mount that's designed for this one. Now, if you see on this one right here, Tell me I have to put that apart. That would suck. Yeah, dude. Okay, so I got Bilstein shocks. If you get different shocks, they, they might vary. But the hardware that came with it, I got this little, this little washer and the nut. The washer is actually the mount seat. It goes on first, then your mount, then your nut. Now, this is a Stover lock nut. So, it's gonna take a fair amount of oomph to get that down. Now, these are my shocks. I don't wanna put um, vice grips around here. Uh, again, I don't really think it'll do that much. I wanna prevent this shaft from spinning rapidly and wearing out the seals inside here, right? Because I want to put in a new shock that actually works. So, how do we do that? Well, put that up in here. Let me just readjust you for a second. So I, in fact, do hold the Allen on these. Because again, I want to have a useful shock. It's a six mil Allen. So I'll use a six mil Allen wrench. Um, it's really handy having a, a set of pass through sockets. I have the Astro Pneumatic uh, half inch shallows. They're fantastic. They go from 10 mil all the way up to 24, every size inclusive. And the thing that's really nice about them, not only are they super shallow, but they have a 24 mil, sorry, a 22 mil hex on the end of them. So they can be used as pass throughs or just with a regular wrench, you know, more often than not, I use these just to, um, just to change the offset of something, right? So say here's your wrench, you only got the 15 degrees. Well, you can't quite get onto a lot of things because you, you know, there's bracket or something in the way, but you don't quite have enough room for a full ratchet. So I use these, boom, you got just the perfect amount of space that you need for a lot of things, you know, torque converter bolts, all that sort of stuff. So these are fantastic. But anyways, what this allows me to do, and it also comes, you can buy a double box end wrench, ratcheting wrench. It's flex head, both ends. This is also Astro Pneumatic. So the top is a 22 mil for these guys. The bottom is a 17 mil for the 3 8 um, nano sockets by them. I don't find the 3.8 sockets are enough of a difference between regular 3.8 sockets, so I never bothered with them, but the half inch ones are awesome. But anyways, I digress. It's a ratcheting wrench, a 22 mil ratcheting wrench. So we put this guy up on top there. Now I have to start off with going this way 
Well, how the heck are you supposed to hold this end? Well, it's a six mil Allen, right? Let's use a six mil socket. Hey, hey, hey. Sometimes you gotta use the noggin. Got the nut driver, the six mil socket on there to hold the Allen socket. And yes, it's kind of awkward and it's annoying, but this way I'm not destroying my shock. So that's the whole purpose. I want to actually be able to drive my car without having to worry about going over uneven bumps. Okay, so now it's getting a little too too low. So we put the socket in there first, and then, and then the ratchet on top. So we don't quite have enough depth. Um, to have the ratchet fully over the socket, so we're just going a little bit over the edge. If that makes sense. Okay, so now we switch over the Allen because my Allens are wobble ends and uh, that's not gonna grip it enough. So we can put that guy like that, get that guy in there, put our nut driver back on there, and just give it that final twerk. Oh yeah! And there you have it. One shock ready to go in. Now I know it's kind of ugly with this um, bump stop just hanging there. And there's no dust shield on there, but if you look, this dust shield is flat, whereas this mount is recessed, so it wouldn't work. It would limit your travel quite a bit. This bump stop is gonna limit the travel um, an inch, inch and a half or so. The top will squish, no problem. But you know what, I kind of like it rather than nothing because uh, you don't want to bottom them up anyway. So, uh, we'll get this ready to set up. Okay, so we're back at the car. We got our shock. Now the one thing I will mention, when we go to put these two, uh, the mounting bolts back in for our mount, since they're going upright, and since this thing is kind of hammering on them all the time, I'm going to put some blue Loctite on these. And I just put a little bit on the edge. Don't need to go crazy with it or anything. It's just an insurance thing. I'm going to make sure that they're tight, but it makes me feel better. Now we got to see if we can't get this up in there. There we go. So if you just bought a shock and it's been sitting on the shelf for a while, you might need to put some weight behind it to get the initial compress. And then once you do that, that is a little bit better. But these are, oh my God. Mm, stiff. Oh, there we go. Now the other thing I like to do, the shank of bolts that go through bushings. You don't want to have to deal with these if they get married to the metal of the bushing. Because the shock, the, the bracket of the shock has the two fingers, right? So if this gets married to that bushing, you're going to have an awfully hard time getting it out. So I put anti-seize not on the threads, but just on the shank. And again, you don't have to go crazy. Just 
just a light coating and of course as we put this in there and turn it it'll distribute and the other thing that's nice about screw stands is you can kind of play with your height anything like this always put your through bolt in first because it's easier it's easier to line up your uh, your top uh, your top bolts than than the through bolt and I just put the nut on there just to hold it without tightening anything now So it's a good idea to get multiple threads, not just one or two threads by hand before you try and tighten it with the impact. And uh, the other thing too, you don't want to have to fight that spring with the threads of those bolts. Another reason why a screw stand, or you know, if you're on the ground, uh, a floor jack is fine. Just if you're using a floor jack on the ground, make sure you also put a, a jack stand underneath here. You don't want it just flying out on you, right? So. You don't want those threads pulling against that spring. So I will tighten this up until I have just enough movement that I can slide it that way. The, the screw stand is holding all the, the tension and I'm not cranking against the spring. But uh, same thing as removing it. Uh, don't just slam one and then slam the other. We kind of go back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. We want to seat it properly. And then if any time you're relying upon an electric impact to tighten things, make sure you check the battery. Make sure you have a good charge on here, right? Because you could be hammering down thinking you got it nice and tight, but your battery could be dead and you're barely tightening it at all, right? So this here, I got three bars. It's almost a full battery. I know that's tight. It's always a good idea to put a, a uh, a hand tool on there afterwards so then you really really know but I've used this enough I'm comfortable with it enough I know I'm good so at this point here as well um, this bottom shock mount in that lower control arm there is a bushing there right so like all bushings you want to tighten them at ride height if we tighten that with everything kind of hanging down then what happens is the, the rubber, so if here's the, the outer bore of the control arm, the rubber on the inside, if you tighten it like this with everything hanging, then all of a sudden you bring it up to um, ride height and the, the rubber is constantly at a twist, so it'll wear out faster. Not the end of the world necessarily for this because it's not going anywhere, but you would get a clunk. So again, we've got a screw stand. We're just going to go up until we find that we're putting a bit of force behind this screw stand and we start hearing the, the hoist growing a little bit and we're just going to simulate ride height make it just closer 
It's not perfect, it's not ideal, but it's better than if we did it by hanging, right? There we go, that's about good. Okay, our impact. And now for the bottom one, because we were turning the bolt and holding the nut, this is absolutely one we want to use a hand tool to ensure that it is in fact properly tightened. Yep, that's tight. So anyways, um, shocks, Durangos. Uh, do the Grand Cherokees have these? I think some of them did. Some of the Grand Cherokees had air suspension as well. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but you know what? If you got a really bouncy vehicle, of course, you know, shocks, right? But if you got one of these Durangos and it's, it's kind of really flipping out on you and you, it just it doesn't feel safe when you're driving at high speeds, take a peek at your shocks at the back. Even if you're not planning on changing them yourselves, right? If you got an older Durango and you look and, and you see what the other ones look like, that the big the big base of the shock, and especially if you can make out a sticker that says Saks, then you know you have those goofy load suspension uh, shocks, which I think are junk, and you will benefit from getting a pair of good standard shocks. Because you know what, we all wanna feel safe when we're driving our vehicles. Anyways, uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this one. Um, pretty straightforward for the most part, just a um, couple things to note that if you are changing it over, yes, you can put standard shocks in place. The springs are the same, whether you have standard shocks or the load levelings, everything else is the same. The only thing is if you go to put the standard shocks in, you need the shock mounts. So anyways, uh, as always, just wanna say thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one. And bye for now.